So Philippians chapter 3, I would entitle this sermon, uh, Press Toward the Prize. Press Towards the Prize. Of course, a lot of famous verses in here. But I think what we can learn from this is that, or see from this chapter, is that the reward of the Christian life, uh, you know, is won by sacrifice. You know, he's talking about pressing toward the mark for the high calling of Christ, for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. And then he goes on about all the things that he gave up, you know, all the things that he counted loss. So we can learn a lot about the fact uh, that in order to win the prize, we have to be willing to sacrifice. And you know, that's what I want us to understand tonight. And what's what I want to help us understand is that we need to focus on our heavenly rewards. You know, If we want to earn that prize, we need to be more focused on that than on just our earthly gain. Obviously, there's things in our life here on earth that demand our attention. We have responsibilities to fulfill, but we should not let those become what our life is all about. There's a, a, a reward to be won. We need to press toward that prize, the prize that is in heaven. And Paul shows us, you know, what it takes and what it means, you know, what it takes to win that prize, what it means to press toward the mark, right, is what he said. And if you want to look at uh, verse 13, he shows us there in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind I, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So if you're going to press toward that prize, the first thing you have to understand is that there is a prize to be won, that there is a prize in, uh, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God has a reward for us. God has a prize for us. God has something that he wants us to uh, endeavor to earn in this life, and it requires effort on our part, doesn't it? We have to, uh, we have to press toward it, like Paul said. You know, this prize is, is, we should regard this prize as worthy of attaining. We should look at that and say, there is a prize. What do I have to do to earn it? It's worth my time. Not every prize is worth earning. You know, so we try to motivate people to do certain things. Hey, there's a reward involved. Nah, it's not worth it. I'm telling you, this is a prize you don't want to miss out on. The prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus is not something you want to get there and go, well, you know, Oh, well, I guess I missed out. You're going to be bummed, okay? You ever, if it's a special prize, you do promotion, and there's a, it's, an un, it's a mystery prize, right? And they go, oh, it couldn't be that good. And then the prize gets released, and it's handed out, and you go, man, I wish I would have memorized that, or man, I wish I would have done whatever it was required to earn the prize. I would have done it if I had known it was going to be that cool of a prize. I mean, we can't even fathom what this prize is, it entails completely. We, we see what it is here in the, in, the, in the chapter. But regardless, it's the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This isn't something you want to miss out on. You know, this isn't a promotion you just want to pass up on and say, no thanks. This, there is a prize from God to be won in this life. We need to regard it worthy of attaining because it's his prize. It's God who has offered this prize. But it is us that must win it. You know, we are the ones that have to press toward the mark. We are the ones that have to press toward that prize. And in order to do that, in order to have that um, prize, in order to win that prize, in order to press toward it, we have to have the same mentality that Paul does. We have to have that same outlook that Paul does. We have to have the same perspective that Paul does. And Paul, just sho Paul shows us what his mentality is like in Philippians chapter 3. He says in verse 15, let us therefore as, as many as be perfect be what? Thus minded. He's talking about having a mentality. He's talking about having an attitude, a way of looking at life, a way of how I'm going to conduct myself, a philosophy about how I'm going to conduct myself in this life so that I can attain the prize that God has set before me. Paul encourages us to follow his example and the examples of others. How do we press toward that prize? This, you know, pressing towards a prize is not us blazing some trail. It's not us just going off the rails and, and, and just going solo. No, it's, it, it's a following after of those that have gone on before us. Paul lays it all out here for us. He, he shows us what we need to do in order to press toward the prize. And a big part of pressing towards the prize is following. There's a following involved in following particular people. Paul encourages us in this chapter to follow his example and to follow the example of others. If we want to win that prize, you say, I'm, I don't want to miss out. Okay, great. You want to earn that prize. Well, you, now you got to follow. You got to follow in the footsteps 
of our spiritual forefathers. We need to follow in the footsteps of Paul and of Christ. We need to follow particular people. You can't just follow anybody. You've got to follow particular people. Uh, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to end up there in a minute. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers. There's a lot of people that can add things to us, right? There's a lot of people we can always learn from. But, you know, there's certain people in our lives that are just going to be like fathers to us in Christ. What are they? They're going to be guides. They're going to be, uh, you know, spiritual mentors to us. They're going to show us the way in which we need to go. And those are the people that we need to follow. We need to mark those people and follow them. <clears throat> For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. That's what Paul was begging the Corinthian people to do. Not just go figure it out. Just go blaze a trail. Just go do whatever you want. No, he said, follow me. Do what I'm doing. Be followers of me, he said in chapter 11, even as I am of Christ. Of course, we don't just blindly follow people. We have to follow them as they follow Christ. And if they stop following Christ, well, we just keep following Christ. We need to follow particular people. If you're going to press toward the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, you're going to have to follow particular people. You're going to have to be thus minded. You're going to have to do what? Walk by the same rule. You have to walk by the same rule. He said in verse 16, nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. How are you going to follow? How are we going to follow Paul? How are we going to follow Christ? How are we going to follow uh, the guides in the Christian in our Christian lives? We're going to walk by the same rule. Let us be. Uh, let us mind the same thing. What does it mean to walk by the same rule? Well, what is a rule? It's basically it's just a principle. It's a regulation, right? It's a governing of our conduct. Rules, they, they put up the barriers in our life. They keep us on the path. You know, they say, you go walking on these paths, and they say, you know, stay on the path. Don't go walking out in the woods if you, you get lost. That's a rule. And we need to walk by the same rule. And we have a rule, don't we? We have this is our rule right here. We have the Word of God to, that sets up the guideposts in our life. It says, you know, you are here. <laughs> you need to get here. When you got to follow this path to get there. There's going to be ups, there's going to be downs. Some parts are going to be narrow, some parts are going to be wide, but you have to, what, walk by that rule. We need, to, we need to walk by the same rule. So we need to follow particular people in our lives. We need to follow them. We need to walk by the same rule. We need to be of the same mind. Look there in 2 Timothy, verse, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. It's good to know doctrine, isn't it? We should know doctrine. You know, we should learn the truths of God's word. That's important. Is that all that Paul had to impart to Timothy? Just what the Bible says about some subject? No, no, of course, again, we're not downplaying that. That's important. And Paul did spend a lot of time writing many things in the scriptures, explaining many great truths of God's word to us, didn't he? But that's not all he had to offer as a father to Timothy whom he called my son in the faith, whom somebody he was guiding and leading in the Christian life, he said, look, it's not, you've known my doctrine, but was that all? No, he went on and said, in my manner of life. You know the way I lived, Timothy. You know how I've, what, conducted myself. You know what rule I've minded. You, you know what rule I've walked by in my life, is what he's telling Timothy. You've known my manner of life, the way that I've lived. You know, we should follow particular people and we should note that the, the way that they live their lives. If they're, if they're following Christ, if they're living for God, we should say, hmm, how are they raising their children? What are they doing with their time? What's important to them? What are their values? That's what Timothy knew about Paul. Yeah, he knew a lot of doctrine, but he also knew what? His manner of life. Because the Christian life isn't just about knowing doctrine. And, you know, there's people out there, they get real puffed up because they learn a lot about the Bible. You know, they get on YouTube and they spend a lot of time just taking in a lot of material and learning a lot of doctrine, and that's, that's great. But you know what? The Christian life isn't just about learning doctrine. It's about living it. A Christian life isn't just, you know, some problem that you, you know, just some equation that you figure out. The Christian life is something that's intended to be lived. 
to be fleshed out in our lives. It's something that we have to uh, have a manner of living about. It's not just about doctrine, it's about living it. We need to follow particular people, people who walk by the same rule, who have a conduct, who have a manner of life. We need to follow people who mind the same thing. He said in verse 16 of, of Philippians chapter 3, stay in 2 Timothy 3, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. You know, we should follow people who have similar goals, who share the same goals. Those are the people that we should follow. Those are the people that we fellowship with. We shouldn't be unequally yoked with, um, together with unbelievers. You know, there, obviously there's a degree to which that is, is appropriate. We have to work with people. We have supervise. We got to interact with the world. We need to be in the world, but not of it. But look, the people that we're following, the people that are, we're looking to and saying, I'm going to mimic their manner of life, that it shouldn't be unbelievers. It should be people who what? Mind the same thing. People who have the, the same goals. They have the same mentality. They have the same outlook on life. They have a biblical perspective on things. That's what Paul told Timothy. You're there again in verse 10, chapter 3. He said, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, you know my manner of life. But what else did he say? Purpose. You know what my purpose was. You knew what my drive was. You know what motivated me, Timothy. You've known these things about me. We should follow people and we should understand not only what their doctrine is, not only what their manner of life is, but we should understand what their purpose is and we should, and we should follow them in that purpose. And what is, our, what is our purpose? The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of God's word, living for Christ. That's our purpose in life. Now that Paul said for me, to, for me to, to die is gain. And to what? To live is Christ. That was his purpose, Christ. So we should follow particular people. If we're going to press toward the prize, you need to follow very particular people, people who mind the same thing, people who have the similar goals, the, who share the same goals. You know, and in concluding of this first point, in order to follow particular people, it's going to mean you have to avoid others, doesn't it? You can't follow, you know, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for you will love the one and hate the other, or you hold the one and, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, which is money, right? But even, even beyond that, you can't, you can't have two different philosophies about life. You can't say, well, I'm going to do the things the way the world does it and the way the Bible tells me to do it. It's, they're, they're at odds. That's never going to work. You're trying to bring two polar opposites together. It's not going to work. So in order to follow particular people, in order to press toward that prize and follow people toward that, there's other people who have to say, well, I can't follow you. I'm sorry, I can't have fellowship with that. I'm not going to do things that way. <clears throat> Some examples of people we should not follow would be people who don't have the same doctrine. He said, thou hast fully known my doctrine, Timothy, right? The Bible teaches us, go over to Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, that there's some people that we can't follow them if they have the wrong doctrine. The Bible says in Romans 16, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Not just mark them. Not just say, oh, this person's got the wrong doctrine. This person's caused division. It's to mark them and then what? Avoid them. Why do I avoid them? Because I'm too busy following somebody who's leading me on the right way. I'm too busy pressing toward the, 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 the prize. I'm too busy pressing toward the mark. I'm not going to sit here and mess around with somebody who I know is off. doesn't make any sense. You know, that's why I leave the bozos alone on YouTube. <laughs> and then you say, bring this into the, to, into the real world, right? You know, up, bring this into modern times. Bozos on YouTube should be marked and what? Avoided. Every now and then, someone will tell me about some, what some bozo said somewhere. I'm just, did, oh, did you see what some bozo said about you or your past or something? No. <laughs> why not? Because I don't pay attention to it. Because the Bible says to mark them and then avoid them. That's the two parts to that equation. We're real good about the first one. Sometimes that second one of the avoiding, we could probably use some improvement. <laughs> he said in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which ha uh, walk so as ye have us for an example. 
There's some people we should mark and avoid. There's some people we should mark and say, well, they're doing things the way Paul does them. We should mark uh, those people that are doing things the right way, who, have, who mind the same rule, who, who, who walk by the same rule, who mind the same thing. We should mark those people and say, well, those are the people I'm going to follow. Those are the people I'm not going to avoid. But this guy over here, who hath not the doctrine of Christ and hath not God, I'm not going to follow him. In fact, I'm going to mark him and then I'm going to avoid him because I'm too busy following somebody who has the right manner of life, who has the right doctrine, who has the right purpose. That's who I'm going to follow. It's hard to follow somebody who's doing the right way if you're always looking over here. <laughs> what, what's that bozo doing over there? We need to keep our eyes on the one that we're following, which is ultimately Christ. <clears throat> There are some people we need to avoid. If we're going to follow people, the particular people, and we're going to press toward the prize, there are some people we're going to have to avoid and mark and avoid. If you're there in Philippians, hopefully you're keeping something there. I know I have you in Romans 2, but we're going to go there in a minute. There's some particular people in verse 2 that he mentions, isn't there, that we need to avoid. He says, beware of dogs. And if you were here Sunday night, you know what he's referring to. The sodomite, right? reprobates. And you know, these are all, you know, you could say these are each one of these is a different person or is he talking about one group as a whole? Well, I think you could take it either way. He said, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. You know, people that want to creep in. People that want to infiltrate, teach false doctrine. That's an evil work. Beware of the concision. And that's a reference, obviously, to the circumcision, which is the reference to who? The Jews which is a particularly bad group in Paul's day. That's, that's who his, you know, number one enemies were back then. That's who's always, you know, following him from this city to that city, stoning him, persecuting him, arresting him. It's, it's the concision. It's the Jews. So he says that there's some people you need to mark very specifically and make sure you avoid them. <clears throat> we could talk about the dogs. We could talk about the evil workers. We could talk about the concision. But ultimately... As it says in verse 19, it's those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. You don't want to follow people who just mind earthly things. They don't, because they don't mind the same rule. They don't walk by the same rule. They don't, they don't mind the same thing. They don't have the same purpose. They don't have the same mentality. They mind earthly things. Is that what we mind? It shouldn't be. You know, we should be minding heavenly things. Those are people we have to mark, and especially when it comes to particularly evil people whose end, the Bible said, is destruction. I'm not going to follow somebody who's going somewhere else than I want to go. You know, I'm, I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm going to heaven. Why would I follow somebody whose end is destruction? What do I care about what anybody has to say if their end is damnation? Why do I need to go talk to the concision why do I need to bring in some Jewish rabbi to explain to me, you know, uh, Jewish wedding customs so I can understand the pre-trib rabbi? You know, it's, I'm not interested in what he has to say about any of that. I don't care what some unsaved, you know, uh, hater of God has to say about anything when it comes to spiritual matters. I don't care. Their end is destruction. Why would I follow anything that they have to say about anything? The Bible says in verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who I'm going to mind. That's who I'm going to follow. People that are who have a conversation that ends in heaven, because we have the same purpose. People whose end is different. People whose uh, current standing differs from. Where not only are they going to end up somewhere else than where we're going to end, but their current standing is no good either. They're different from us. There are people that need to be avoided if we're going to follow the people that we should follow. He said in verse 3, For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So Paul is saying, look, we're the Jews, not them. They are they that they say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of, of Satan. Are you in Romans chapter 2, verse 28? Look at verse 28. He says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Look, their end is destruction, and their current standing isn't even the same as mine. 
Why would I follow them? They're not a Jew. He says, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So I'm not going to follow people that have, are headed in a different direction and are, have, a, have a, a completely different standing currently than I do. They say, oh, we're the Jews. No, we are. We are. You know, I was thinking about this. We, every so often we get these voicemails from some whatever ministries, you know. Hak Flem Ministries calls us. Promoting, you know, some Jewish rabbi. They call him a Jewish pastor. You know, and I guess he's different. He's, you know, he's got, they say, you know, he's a Christian Jewish pastor. Like he's a Jew that became a Christian. I don't know. I've never called him back, but I, from, they call like every few months and they don't call us by name. They just say, dear pastor, you know, former rabbi, Jewish pastor, a lot of, you know, oy vey wants to come and would speak to your congregation. And I want to call him back and say, well, we already got a Jewish pastor. Did you guys know you have a Jewish preacher? You got a Jewish preacher right here. We got a Jewish pastor up in Tempe. I got a Jewish congregation. I don't need some guy with, you know, wearing a funny hat and long hair on the, you know, on the sides of his head to come in here and try to get me to put a shawl on my head or, you know, wear dangly things from my waistbands or whatever, put ribbons of blue on my garments. I don't need any of that. I don't need some guy to come in here and try to Judaize me in this congregation. I already am the Jew. That's what the Bible says. I mean, we just read it. He says in Galatians 3, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Look, if you're born again, if you're of faith, you're God's child. You are the child of Abraham. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is good if the heart be established for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. What's he talking about there? To be occupied with meats. It hasn't prof- it, it, it's a good thing for the heart to be established with grace. Well, by grace are you saved through faith. It's a good thing for your heart to be established by grace and not with meats. He's talking about the cardinal ordinances. He's talking about the offerings. Which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. There's no profit in, in some Jewish custom. There's no profit in it. There's some, you know, there's some people we're just going to have to learn to avoid if we're going to follow the people that matter. And it's going to be along the lines of, of purpose. It's going to be along the lines of manner of living. And yes, it will be along the lines of doctrine. So if we're going to press toward that prize, you know, Paul is showing us here tonight some things that we have to do. We have to follow particular people, sometimes to the exclusion of others. Well, not only that, but we also have to forget the past. Forget the past. And, you know, good or bad, forget the past. You know, we don't want to sit here and dwell on our, you know, our glory days. And we don't want to sit here and beat ourselves up over some wicked past either. You know, Paul said that we should lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily so, doth so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You need to lay aside these things, these weights, these sins. Sometimes these weights aren't necessarily sinful. Sometimes these weights are just guilt or it's just some pride or just some uh, vain glory that we need to just set aside and press toward the mark. We need to forget the past. Maybe it's worldly accomplishments. That's what Paul did. Look at verse 4 of Philippians chapter 3. Though I uh, might also have confidence in the flesh, he said, if any other man think that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. You know, he's making a point. All the, they want to, the concision wants to come in and Judaize you and bewitch you. Some man wants to make his boast in the law. Well, you know what? If we're going to go there, Paul said, let's go there. Because if we go there, he says, I'm going to win. He said, if, and he said there, if any man thinketh that he have whereof that he might trust in the flesh because of his pedigree, because of his past, because of his worldly accomplishments, I am more. He said, circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel. 
of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But the things which uh, were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He's saying all those worldly accomplishments, when I was eight days old and they, they fulfilled the law, when they brought me to the temple and had me circumcised, count it loss. It was worthless. The fact that I'm a, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew, of Hebrew, though I kept the law as a Pharisee and I was blameless, I count it loss. Those were things that, you know, people put a lot of effort into, himself and his parents. His upbringing brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, and he, there was a lot of past that Paul had that he could have boasted about. But Paul was pressing towards the prize, wasn't he? He was pressing toward that mark. And when he was doing that, in that process, what he learned to do was forget the past. Even the things that the world would look at and just go, wow, good job, real impressive. We'll see what Paul thought of him here in a minute. We have to forget our past, good or bad, worldly accomplishment, earthly aspirations, the things that we want to accomplish only in this life. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be ambitious. I'm not saying we shouldn't work hard. We shouldn't try to achieve things in this life. But look, when those aspirations compete with our heavenly ones, they become detrimental. They get in the way of the prize. When we get so wrapped up in some worldly accomplishment that it takes us off from following and pressing towards that prize, you have to ask yourself, is it really worth it in the long run? In the world, it might, it might profit you a great deal. It might bring a lot of praise and you know, it might get some accolades and so on and so forth, but what's it going to get you in heaven? Is it, if, it ta- if it robs you of that prize, I don't care what it brings in this life. It wasn't worth it. <clears throat> i got to move along here for sake of time. But if we remember last week, we talked about the fact that as soldiers for Christ, we have to make sacrifices. We can't be entangled with the affairs of this life. We have to learn to forget the past. Maybe not even things that are necessarily good or bad, but anything that might compete with Christ, we have to be willing to let go of that if we want to press toward the prize tonight. That's what Paul said in verse 8. And say, everything, everything, anything that gets in the way of me and Christ, good or bad, that's going to rob me of that prize needs to be forsaken. He says there in verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things. How many things, Paul? All things. Loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. You know, he suffered the loss of all these things, and he didn't sit there and boo-hoo about it. He said, look, I lost those things, and I'm earning Christ, and I, and I, I look at what I'm gained, the knowledge of the excellency of Christ through the loss of those things. I look back at those things, and I say, it's dung. It's dung. It's worthless. That I may win Christ. What Paul was is a sellout. We probably all have heard that term, right? A sellout, everyone knows what a sellout is. You know, being a sellout is typically a bad thing, right? You sellout. But that's what Paul was. He was a sellout for Jesus. I mean, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I mean, he was the man, right, in that that, uh, group of people among the Jews. And they would look at Paul and say, he sold out for Jesus, And that is what he did. Make no mistake about it. But that's what we need to do. We need to be able, willing to do the same thing. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul, it says of him in Galatians 1, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. He's talking about there's some people the apostles had, that had heard that he which persecuted us in times past, when he was a Jew, when he was a Pharisee, when he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, persecuted us in times past, persecuted the church. That guy is now preaching the faith once he destroyed. You know what he is? He's a sellout. He switched sides. He betrayed that old life 
and God on Christ's side. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's look for verse 26. Paul's listing off all the things that he's suffered for Christ. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen. He's saying, I, I sold out and they hated me for it. They said I was a traitor. In perils in the heathen, the city, so on and so forth. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Keep that in mind. The fact that he was in perils among his own countrymen, when he sold out for Christ, when he said, I'm going to forget the past, I'm going to follow Christ, I'm going to press toward the mark, you know what it did? It put him at odds with the old life. It put him at odds with the old crowd. It put him in perils by his own countrymen. You know, the same thing will happen to me and you. The same thing will happen to me and you. Look, if you sell out for Jesus, you will be in perils among your own countrymen. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Unless, you know, everybody else you happen to know is sold out for Jesus too, but I don't think there's anybody in the room that's like that. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. They say, you're not doing that anymore. You're not coming around anymore. You, you're going to church now. You, you've changed. You don't run to the same excess of riot. I remember being told, you know, the, the old you would make fun of the new you. That's what I was told. The guy I knew a year ago would make fun of the guy you are today. I sold out. I don't know what to tell you. And it's not that they go, oh, well, good for you. No, it says speaking evil of you. They're going to speak evil of it. They, you will be, like Paul, in perils with your own countrymen. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 2, where you are in verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers. Right? That's what we're talking about tonight. Pressing toward the prize. Following after. Ye became followers of the churches of God which are in Judea, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered the like things of your own countrymen. I mean, Paul went through it. People in Thessalonica went through it. Should it really surprise us if it happens to us? No, it's guaranteed. Jesus said a man uh, uh, said a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and in his among his own kin and in his own house. He said, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So if we're going to press toward the prize, you better just sit down and you know, count the cost. Because it's not that we get to just get in, in engaged in the Christian life and start pressing toward that mark, and it doesn't come at any cost to us. It does. That's what Paul said. I count all things but what? Loss. There was loss there. There was a giving up there. There was a forsaking there. And the cost is going to be, to some degree or another, the fact that our foes will be those of our own household. Our own countrymen are going to look at us and say, sell out. And that, you know what? Go ahead and call me that. Because I sold out for the right side. I sold out for the right side. I mean, you think Paul regretted that? When all the Pharisees were mad at him for what he did? Oh, you know, well, it really makes me really ought to rethink my decision here. I don't know. Paul, you could have been the next high priest. Oh, wow, well, gee. He said, that's dung. It's dung. I've got the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Everything else is dung. But there is a cost, isn't there? Which is my la leads me to my last point. Because if we're going to press toward the prize, we have to follow particular people, and we have to forget the past, you need to fix your eyes on the prize. Fix your eyes on the prize. You want to press toward that mark, you got to keep your eyes on the prize. Look at verse 8. He said, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them that, but dung, that I may win Christ. See, sometimes in this life, we get so obsessed with everything we're giving up. We get so obsessed with how having to suffer the loss of whatever. And we get so worried about that, we don't keep our eyes on the prize. We don't, we don't see what the exchange is there. Yeah, there is this loss. There is this... It's costing us something, but we're, what are we gaining? And if we would just keep our eyes on the prize of what we're gaining and what we're going to gain, I'm telling you, we'd be able, like Paul, look back and say, dung. But so often we give, we give up those things. We just, oh. 
Oh, I can't leave it. We go back. We need to look and keep get our eye on the prize. Fix your eyes on the prize. He said in verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through Christ, the faith of Christ, the righteousness which uh, is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That's a pretty good exchange. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And and of course, he's talking real specifically about salvation. He's saying, look, I forsook the righteousness in the law. I counted but dunk that I could know the power of the resurrection in Christ. It's a good exchange. <clears throat> Verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either all, were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend for that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Look, we are already apprehended of Christ. If you're saved, God has, has you in his hand. You are apprehended. That's what it means to be apprehended, to be taken hold of. And he said, you know, no man shall pluck them out of my hand. And now it's just this process of being able to apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of. You know, God's got a hold of us. What we need to do in this Christian life is reach right back and get a hold of him. And like he told Timothy, lay hold on eternal life. Come to grips with the reality of who you are in Christ. The power of the resurrection. He said, But I follow after that I may apprehend for that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I haven't arrived. It's a process. I'm still pressing toward that mark. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You say, well, Paul, you make it sound so easy. (laughs) You just make it sound so easy. Oh, I just press toward the mark. But there's effort there, isn't there? This pressing toward the mark. He didn't say, you know, I just tiptoe toward the mark. I just skip down. I'm not going to skip for you. I skip toward the mark. He said, I press. There's resistance. It's work. I have to put effort into it. I press toward the mark. You know, it's well, that sounds difficult. Well, here's the thing. It's easier when you consider what you're gaining. It's easier to be like Paul and say, that's dung. I give, I gladly I forsake that. I gladly sell out for Christ when you consider what you're gaining. He counted all things lost for what? The excellency of the knowledge of Christ. That was the exchange. Every, I'll take, you know, you can take all that. That's lost. I'll gain the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. He counted everything dung that he what? May win Christ. Good exchange. If you got those things which are behind, why? So you could reach forth unto those things which are before. If we're going to press toward the prize tonight, we need to fix our eyes on the prize and we need to understand what we are gaining in Christ. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying fix your eyes on the prize. Understand what you got, what you have gained in Christ. The prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, and he gets specific here at the end, and we'll close on this, you know, about the reality of that prize. Look at verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is even able to subdue all things unto himself. I mean, he has the ability to subdue all things in himself, and part of the prize that Christ has given us in him is the fact that we are going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Paul said when he was in, you know, I believe it was him that was in heaven that was given that vision, that he saw things which were not lawful for him to utter. And he, we do get this little nugget right here, though, don't we? We get this little bit of understanding of what exactly that prize is. You know, and I'm glad we don't know what everything is that we're going to get. It's kind of like that Christmas present. You ever guessed your Christmas present? You know how disappointing that is? That's when I just said, I'm not picking up another gift again. I pick it up, you know, it's this. I had an aunt, she guessed her, their first Christmas with my uncle. After they got married, she guessed every prize or every present. 
What a lame Christmas. I was right. Uh, I was right again. I was right again. <laughs> and then you're like, what'd you get? Oh, that's right. I bought your gifts. I know what you got too. I'm glad that the, 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 the prize in Christ is a mystery. But he gives us this little taste here, right? He says, our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he's able to subdue all things to ourselves. And I, and I know we know this, but we understand 1 John 3 where he says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Understand what you're going to gain in Christ. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Immortal uh, immortality, a new body. That's you know this isn't just some Baptist fairy tale. This is Bible. It's what it says. That's a reality for the Christian. Once we start to wrap our minds around that, man, the things of this world just. You know that's why Paul is able to say, I, "I've learned whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content." He said, "I can do all things through Christ." We'll see that next week. Why? Because he understood what the prize was. He, he was pressing toward that mark. <clears throat> I know that we know that there is a prize to win. We all understand that. We've all heard the preaching about that, that glorious body, the inheritance that we have in Christ. So why bring that up again? These are famous passages. I've heard all this before. Well, go to verse 1. You know, this is, this is a truth that we really need to lay hold on in our lives and really nail down. I mean, we hear it and then we forget it. We hear it and we say, oh, there's a prize to be won. I got to press toward the mark. And then we go out there and we get distracted. And we go out in the world and we, we get caught up in something else that just come, takes us away from the prize, takes us away from pressing toward that mark. That's why Paul said in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me, indeed, it's not grievous. He said, I don't mind writing the same thing. You think Paul bothered him to sit there and, and think about that glorious body and the prize of Christ Jesus? He says, I love thinking about that. It's what keeps me going. Paul had his eyes fixed on the prize. He said, to write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. You know, this is something that we need to preach. This is something we need to remind ourselves of, that there is a prize to be won in Christ. And it's up to us to press toward that prize. How are we going to do that? By following particular people. We're going to do that by marking those in, in their doctrine and their manner of life and following them as they follow Christ. We're going to do that, you know, at having to avoid others. We're going to do that by what? Forgetting the past, even if it's worldly accomplishments. <clears throat> That's how we're going to press toward that prize. And here's the thing, if we follow, if, we press, if we're going to press toward that prize and we follow, you know, we're not going to forget. We're not going to forget. It's going to fix our eyes on what matters most. We're not going to forget. And we're not in danger of, of not winning it, of not winning the prize. If, we're going to, if we do this, if, if, if we can get a hold of this tonight, and what Paul's showing us here, the prize that is there to be won, and, and we... And, and we we don't lose sight of that, and we fix our eyes on that, you know, success is guaranteed. You know, the, the prize will be won. I mean, I understand we're going to go to heaven no matter what, but not everyone's going to have, not everyone's going to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, just, that's not just automatic. You have to earn that, right? That, that, like I preached last week, good reputations don't come easy. You know, uh, not everyone that's going to get there is going to have the same rewards. The Bible teaches that. And look, if we want that prize, if we want the biggest prize we can get, you need to press toward that, part, that, that, uh, that mark. You got to press toward it. You got to put effort into it. You got to make it happen because it's not just going to happen on its own. Let's go ahead and pray.